Keith Smith at Keith Smith NBA, contributor for Yahoo Sports NBA, Real GM. And you can hear him right here on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline as we get ready to talk a little hoops. What's going on, Keith? Welcome back. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, man. Uh, so uh, here we go down the stretch as we can, we've can. we been kind of uh, looking at here. But uh, I, I want to get your take, uh, number one, on that Celtics road trip. Uh, they beat the Warriors. They get the Kings win. They lose the game to the Clippers. And as we get to these final 15 or so games, we had talked last week, and we said that game against the Kings was going to be pretty important, and they end up winning that game. So has your opinion or has anything changed about the way we're viewing Boston down the stretch here? Yeah, I think you have to feel pretty good if you're uh, you know, rooting for the Celtics or you're you know just thinking about their, their prospects for the rest of this year because when you win – big in in Oakland over the Warriors. Then on the second night of a back-to-back, they knocked off the Kings. Then they went down to Los Angeles and took care of the Lakers. And then you kind of knew the Clippers game might go a little sideways when the day before the players are all talking about how five days in L.A. was a loss, which is, you know, NBA code for we've been having some fun off the court here. So it's, uh, you know, overall a 3-1 road trip. You know, down, out west, no one has swept a California road trip in a very, very long time. So 3-1, you got to feel pretty good about that. Yeah, and I know uh, Tatum didn't play. They had some injury issues going forward here. But uh, you move forward here. How are we feeling about Kyrie after the road trip now? Do we feel like some of that stuff is behind them and that, hey, they now have that difference-making player clear-minded and ready to go for these final 15? You know, I think it, you're, you're probably feeling pretty much the same. I do think – he did an interview with my uh, my guy Chris Haynes over at Yahoo, where he you know really took ownership for a lot of things, and you know said you know hey I shouldn't have said some of the stuff I did say, and you know I didn't handle things the best way, and I'm still learning and growing and figure this out. So you know good for him for for owning that because I think we all you know saw that and it was a little you know eyebrow raising some of the comments. So I think you feel you know a little bit better about that. That you know at the end of the day this is still a guy who's in his you know mid twenties and he's trying to figure out exactly who he is and what he wants to do. And I think taking the ownership of that, it goes a long way. Uh, Keith Smith, uh, Yahoo NBA here on the Sports Bash 97.3 ESPN. Uh, Philly last night, they got a win. Not impressive. They didn't look like they were really engaged in the game. That kind of happened this late in the season, especially Cleveland had the game the night before, so they were on a back-to-back. I feel like Philly kind of took them a little light last night, but they got the win over the Pacers on Sunday, and they looked impressive in doing so. So you look at Embiid and those starters. Does that team, in your mind, with Embiid back and Tobias and finally playing. They only played four games together going into the, the, the Pacer game. So does that team elevate itself after what you've seen over the weekend? Yeah, I think they have shown that when they're at their best and they're kind of all engaged and they're on the same page, that they can beat anybody. They're, there's not a team in the league that they don't feel like they can match up with and take care of. A lot of that has to do with Joel Embiid being healthy. That's obviously very important because when he's healthy, he's the most dominant offensive big man that there is in the NBA. So it, it really that alone raises their their floor and their ceiling quite a bit. So, but when you get down to it, I, I don't worry about the Cleveland game. I know you know you you said it. It's like handing people a free bag of money and they complain about how heavy it is. I had a boss who used to say, "I give everyone a gold bar," and then you complain about carrying it to your car. And it really is the, the same kind of thing. It's, you know, at this point, when you're in mid-March, this is the dog days of the season, and you're a good team. As long as you get the win, that's all that really matters. Yeah, if you were to lose that game last night, it would have been, you know, it, I mean, you're not going to be – it's not going to debilitate you, but uh, you would have opened the door for Boston. You now have a two-game gap there. You're still ahead of uh, Indiana. The question really with Philly and, and you know, how hard it's going to be to integrate everything with this few games left. But did they have – last year their problem was they didn't have an athletic enough team to really defend Boston. Is their bench deep enough and are they athletic enough to kind of match up with a Boston or a Toronto and, you know, even Milwaukee now who, uh, you know, they have some pretty good athletes there even though they depend on the three a lot? I, I think they're in a better place, but I still think that there are some holes – 
in certain lineups. Teams are going to we, – we saw it last night. You saw it in the Indiana game. We've seen it all year. Teams are going to go at J.J. Redick. They're really going to force him to defend and, you know, make him have to, you know, hold his own on that end. And that's going to be something we're going to continue to see. They still don't have a really great option for defending scoring point guards. That's part of the reason why the Celtics continue to have success because Boston feels like, hey, we've got, you know, Kyrie Irving. They don't have anybody who can guard him. And and that's not, you know, a knock on a guy like Jimmy Butler. But Jimmy Butler at this stage in his career is not going out and locking down point guards night to night. It's just not, you know, who he is as a defender. So those are a couple holes, but they've got enough talent that they can certainly steam around it. And then they're also obviously a very hard guard on the other end of the floor. Yeah. I I want to get your opinion on that because we talk a lot about the – principles in the NBA that, that that switching the switchable who's switchable switching units you know it seems that a lot of defense in the NBA now is all it's almost a benefit and a curse that you could be six foot ten and be able to guard multiple players but now it seems that coaching is taking some advantage of the fact that okay you're six ten we could just pull you out because we know you're going to switch even though sometimes it seems like the switch isn't necessary yeah, that does happen, and that's one of the things, you know, teams call them low-resistance switches, switches, which is when, you know, guys are switching, and it was like, did you really need to switch, you know, there? And that that's something that, you know, drives coaches really crazy. They, they don't want their guys doing that. They want you to, you know, execute what the game plan is. If the game plan is to switch everything, that's fine. Switch everything, but don't switch unless we really have to because otherwise you're putting, our, you're putting yourself in a really tough – situation there and that's what teams do with Philadelphia they want to get to Embiid isolated where he's going to have to go out and defend on the perimeter and again the Celtics have that success against them because they just put Al Horford in there and say all right go defend him around the perimeter and Joel Embiid has improved at that that's not where you want him you want him you know back there protecting the basket so that's going to be something they'll have to work on Fortunately, in the playoffs, you can scheme for teams because you have enough time. You're going to see them four to seven games in a row, and that's where a lot of times that's where the coaching comes in big time. Yeah, um, and, uh, of course, this regular season, the Sixers trying to get their way. Uh, they, they, this is, what, the fifth or sixth game, I think. Uh, tomorrow night will be the seventh game. Their starting five will play together. That's if everybody plays. In fact, I got to take that back. Butler didn't play last night, so they've still only played five games together. It should be interesting to see how they fit this all in over the last 15 games here. Keith Smith talking NBA. And then there's Indiana. You know, they have stayed in this thing, but was that game against the Sixers kind of an indictment that they just don't have the top-end talent to stay in the race? Yeah, that's exactly what we're seeing with them. Their biggest problem is they just don't know where to go to get offense late in games when the other team's a good defensive group that locks down. Boyan Bogdanovich can do a lot, but it really puts a lot on him. And then probably their next best option is Darren Collison, and that's a pretty pretty steep drop-off, especially for a playoff team and, and especially for the teams that they're going up against. That's just not – the same kind of matchups that they have. So that's a that's a pretty big challenge for them going forward and it's it's unfortunately there's nothing they can do about it at this point. They're 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 good enough to be competitive with anybody, but they're really just they just don't have enough to pull off those wins at the end of the end of those tight games. Yeah, and I wonder, you know, if you're uh, originally we're like, ah, this Indiana team's hanging around and they're gonna be a problem. Like if you get matched up with them in the playoffs, is it gonna be one of the things where you don't feel like it's going to be that tough of an out because they just don't have that playoff guy to score that big basket. Yeah, you're going to have to work to get past them because they're very good defensively and they're very disciplined. But you do feel good about that, especially if you're Philly, Boston, Toronto, uh, Milwaukee, even potentially Brooklyn, because you feel like we have the best player on the floor in the series and in the playoffs. A lot of times that really matters. If you have the best player, that's usually who you can see come out and win that game unless that guy's completely on his own. And in the case of the teams I just mentioned, none of none of those guys are, are on their own by themselves. So you feel pretty good about your chances. Uh, we're talking with Keith Smith. By the way, did you see any of the Sixer game last night by chance? I did. I watched quite a bit of it, actually. I was flipping between that one and the Pacers-Knicks game because both of them are pretty tight. All right, so – I wanted to ask you about Ben Simmons and whether or not, you know, watching that game, do you see a guy 
that is, number one has become more aggressive, but number two seems more comfortable at the free throw stripe. I think I saw a stat that he's shooting about 80% over the last X amount of games, but his form looks to be smoother, and he just looks more comfortable than he has in the past. He does. He's also looked uh, – he definitely looks good, you know, at the line. He also looks a little more comfortable. Now it was almost – where when he would take a jump shot, it was – you were almost looking at it as like, God, is this, this looks like if you handed a kid a basketball for the first time in their life and said, go ahead and shoot from here, and they didn't know what to do. There were times that's about, about how awkward and uncomfortable it looked. And now it looks like he's really starting to get more comfortable in that. The range still isn't very much. You know, it's still only out to about 15 feet or so. But, you know, overall, I think his game is starting to round out. And a lot of, you know, the, the knock on him and picking on him is, well, while it's fair criticism, it's also fair to point out and remember, this is a guy who's still, you know, very young and he hasn't been in the league very long, and he's going to figure these things out eventually. Yeah, I, I, he does seem to be more comfortable standing at that line and his stroke does appear to be smoother, and we've seen it now for a little bit more consistently. Keith Smith talking some NBA. How about Toronto here? Um, you know, this team made the trade for Gasol, forty-eight and twenty. They look like they, you know, they had that loss to Cleveland the other night. Now they're three back. It looks like they're going to be the number two seed. What does Toronto? Not that they're falling apart or anything. They won six out of ten. But what do you think Toronto needs to tweak or figure out down the stretch here? Yeah, I think they, they're they continuing to go through some, you know, much like Philadelphia, but just on a lesser scale. They're having to figure out exactly who fits together and how they all those guys, you know, make sense on the floor at the same time because they made a lot of changes, too, you know, at the deadline. And, and it wasn't as much as, you know, they really only brought in Gasol and Lynn as rotation players, but they gave up a lot of rotation players. And that, you know, is a – is is always hard on a team when you you know send multiple guys out who are playing you know important minutes for you. So they're they're figuring that out. I think another thing for the Raptors is they are still continuing to they're calling it load management with Kawhi Leonard, but there continues to be concerned that the quad you know condition it's not really an injury, but a condition is still very painful for him, and then that's something they're going to have to manage. And when you're in the regular season, that's fine. Sit him out a game against Cleveland. It's no big deal. But when you're in the playoffs and you're playing every other day, you need him to be in the lineup every other day. And that's something to watch and maybe a little, you know, pause for concern as you're evaluating where the Raptors are at. Is there anything to make of the fact that they have a better record and score more without him, or is that just, you know, circumstance of who they might have played or, you know, something to that effect. Because I can't imagine anybody making an argument that they're a better team without Kawhi, and I'm certainly not. <laughs> yeah, no, they're, they're definitely not. They, um, they, they, if you go back and look, a lot of the games that he has sat out have been against lesser teams. And then, you know, you, you, you also have to consider the fact that they've got an awful lot of good players on that team anyway, even without Kawhi Leonard. And that's something that I think, you know, it matters for them as well. That's part of the reason why they're comfortable with having him sit out games is because, you know, they know that they're in a pretty good place even without him. But, yeah, they're, they're definitely not a better team without him. All right. Uh, now let's look at Milwaukee. For people listening and just see 51-17, and 17, they win by nine points per game. They've won seven out of ten. They've dominated uh, Eastern Conference teams 34-8. and eight. If there's something they sh- people – should know about this team that maybe they just look at the record and say, man, this Milwaukee team is pretty good, but I I don't know much about them. What should they know to make you believe that this Milwaukee team is a legit title contender? Every single guy on the roster knows what their role is and how they fit. And that's really important when you have a superstar like Giannis Antetokounmpo and a second all-star in Chris Middleton and a close to all-star in Eric Bledsoe. You don't need that, you know, fourth, fifth, sixth guy coming in and being like, you know what, I'm going to be the man tonight. I'm going to get mine. I'm going to show everybody just how good I am. They don't have that. Every All their, you know, complimentary players around those three, you know, all-star level players are all really good players who know what, what they're supposed to do. They don't try and do more than that. They rarely, if ever, do less than that. It is one of the best constructed rosters in the NBA, and that's why it's paying off. You know, with the, the great record, as well as I believe they are now 21 and six 
against the other teams that are in the Eastern Conference playoff race now, against the other nine teams, which is just a ridiculous level of dominance at this point in the season. So, at this point, do you list Milwaukee as your favorite in the East? I do. I think it's going to be really important for them that they are able to take care of business quickly in the first round and then that they are healthy in the second round in the Eastern Conference Finals and able to get there, you know, as rested as possible because there is a pretty clear delineation between the top four in the East and the rest of the teams in the conference. And Milwaukee can't afford to, you know, have one of these first round series where some team that they they should have beat in four or maybe five games stretches them to six or seven games because you just want to be able to be rested and ready to go against whoever you're going to get in the second round because it's likely to be a very good team. And then, of course, in the Easter Conference Finals, you just don't want to be adding those extra minutes and miles if you can avoid it. I was going to say, so what is their weakness? What is the kind of team that they don't match up well with? Yeah, they still don't match up well with a team that can take a big man, that can step away from the basket. They like to play what's called drop pick and roll coverage where Brooke Lopez drops back into the middle of the paint. Again, to go back to Boston, that's why Al Horford is so important for the Celtics because he can step out, pull Brooke Lopez out of the paint, and really make him have to work. That that gets really tough on them. They also are um, prone to teams that, that are good at driving the basketball and getting into the paint. The Bucks will sometimes start piling up fouls and make a big mess of things for themselves. So those are the two things that really hurts them at times. The one thing when I watch them play, the one thing I wonder is, in the playoffs, do they cut down that rotation a little bit or do they stick with it? Yeah, I think they'll cut it down. I think you'll see them go to eight or nine guys primarily. I think one of the uh, two backup bigs will drop out of the rotation. They've already kind of, I think, realized, all right, Paul Gasol is not going to be – He's not anything for us. It was a nice, you know, veteran depth move, but, you know, he's not going to give us much. I wouldn't be surprised if first on Ilya Silva is, you know, effectively out of the rotation come playoff time as well, and he's more of a uh, break glass in case of emergency big. And Nikola Mirotic, Giannis, and Brook Lopez are the three big rotation for the Bucs. I'm playoff time. I think that's how they'll cut it down. You hear that, Sixers fans, Ursan out of the rotation, you know, for the people who were – it seemed that Ursan was a step slow. Last year, Boston went right after him, and, uh, you know, he has been a, a nice player from Milwaukee, but uh, not a huge difference maker. All right, you go to the West. You've got the issues going on out there in Golden State. And are they legit issues, or it just, is it just, hey, it's late in the season, we just want to get to the playoffs already? Yeah, it's a little bit of both. They're definitely in that whole we're dealing with the regular season mode. They they just they quite frankly don't care anymore about the, the regular season. And, and unfortunately, because there's a lot of other good teams in the West, well, unfortunately for them, maybe fortunately for everyone else, it could end up costing them home court advantage because they're not going to catch Milwaukee for overall record at this point. And then in the West, You've got Denver's right there. Houston has really rocketed up the standings. Oklahoma City's not going away either. So they're, they're in a tough spot. They're going to have to, you know, start figuring this thing out pretty soon. But then on the flip side, you obviously have it weighing on them of, is Kevin Durant leaving? What's going on with Draymond Green now that he signed with Rich Paul and Clutch Sports? Clay Thompson's a free agent. Some of the bench guys may not be there. DeMarcus Cousins, does he fit or not? How's that all going to work? They've got a lot more questions at this point in the season than they do answers, which is a really different place for the Warriors compared to the last, you know, several seasons. Yeah, does this feel like this is their last legit, you know, run at it where they're the clear-cut favorite? Yeah, it's really starting to feel that way because – Put me in the camp of I believe Kevin Durant is leaving. I think he's going to go somewhere else. I think he can confidently say, I accomplished what I wanted to do by going to the Warriors. I'm going to go somewhere else where, you know, I can, you know, lift a team, whether that's, you know, lift a team into contention like the Knicks from nowhere or lift a team like the Clippers from being a good team to a great team. I think he's going. And then after that, everything could start to really kind of crumble here because there's no viable way to replace any of these guys uh, if they do leave town because you still have Steph Curry on a big contract. 
you know, he makes forty million dollars, and that's a that's a big big number. That's almost half of your cap to have to work around. And a lot of people, you know, this is not what it was before when they added Durant, which was just a stroke of good fortune because some other guys weren't making the kind of money that they probably should have been at that point in time where they were in their careers. Yeah, and I know uh, James Dolan has come out, and he was uh, on New York radio yesterday saying. People are telling him that they're going to get two max players in Kyrie and Durant. There's been a lot of talk there. That would really change the complexity of everything if they were able to get two players of that magnitude. But to get Durant out of Golden State would really change how, you know, you enter a season thinking, ah, it's the Warriors, right? I mean, if, if Durant's out of there, even if they keep the rest of the guys there, if Durant's gone, it becomes wide open again. Yeah, it absolutely does. It becomes completely you know, open it instead of teams going in with a, I think we can beat them. Everybody goes in and says, why not us? You know, mentality, we're just as good as anybody else is. As it stands today, it's kind of, you know, you, you see it on just the vet, the, the different betting, you know, sites and places where it's, you know, Warriors are the field. If, if Kevin Durant leaves, there's no longer that bet on the board. It's just going to be, all right, a bunch of odds for a whole bunch of different teams. And that's, you know, something to really, They'd be different from where the NBA has been since the Warriors kind of came to came to prominence here, and certainly since they added Kevin Durant. Yeah, and Keith, you mentioned the Rockets. They're only three and a half back right now. I mean, they're charging. I don't know if they'll catch Golden State, but they might be able to get over top of Denver, and it could be Golden State-Houston, who played tonight, by the way. We'll have that game on 97.3 ESPN. It starts at 9 p.m., but if the Rockets win that game, I mean, you're only two and a half out of first place. They have been remarkable. Nine wins in a row, nine out of ten here. Uh, that it would be an unbelievable surge by that Rockets team. Yeah, they're they're finally healthy. That's the the big thing for them is they they've been healthy for most of the season. So now that they've got everybody back in place and and everybody's kind of doing their thing for them, they are really you know they they look like the team they looked like last season, which is you know an absolute you know title contender, and that's you know really important to them. And I think in a lot of ways. These injuries, because they weren't um, they, they weren't season ender, ending, they weren't things that should pop up again for any of their guys. I think it's almost in a way could be to their benefit because a guy like Chris Paul, he got a lot of time off and his legs are pretty fresh. A guy like Clint Capello, who has to do a lot for them, is arguably their you know second most important player behind James Harden. He got a lot of time off and was able to rest. So Houston's looking really tough, and they're really kind of coming all together right when you want everybody to be, you know, looking their best. All right. One team in each conference I want to point out here that's playing really well and get your take on. Number one, Detroit. They've won eight out of ten. They've been blistering hot. They were in the sixth spot. They're in the seventh spot right now. But is Detroit a team that is scary come playoff time? If they can keep playing the way they are, yes. But the challenge for the Pistons is they have to – get against a team where they can keep both bigs on the floor at the same time without any worries. If they have to take Blake Griffin or Andre Drummond off the court, it's going to be really hard for them because they're just not built to play without both of those guys on the court during the high leverage minutes. So it matchups are probably as important for them as for anybody in, the, in this year's playoff field. On the western side, San Antonio all of a sudden has won 7 out of 10, 6 in a row. They moved up to the 6th spot. Uh, are the Spurs, who you know made some changes in the offseason, are they starting to get it together now? Yeah, they absolutely are. Another team that's getting healthy. They're getting healthy in their backcourt. They've had a lot of guys in and out all year long. They're really starting to you know figure everything out under Greg Popovich. He's getting the best you know basketball of the season out of – Guys like DeMar DeRozan and Jakob Pertl, who they acquired in the Kawhi Leonard trade, those guys are really starting to come around. And what, what's really interesting now for the um, for the Spurs is you know they're going to go into any playoff series and they're going to go in with an advantage over any team that they play simply because they have Greg Popovich on their sideline. And if you are anybody other than the Warriors and maybe the Rockets, you're going to look across the court and be like, really? We have we we had this great regular season, pushed really hard, and now our our reward is a matchup with the Spurs, and that's just going to be really tough for teams to take. And the fact that the playoffs slow down, that just really plays into San Antonio's hands because they they want to play that way, and they're really built to win in the playoffs. 
So many other things that uh, I wish we could get into. Keith Smith, Yahoo, NBA, Real GM, Celtics blog. He covers the NBA very well. Uh, Minnesota, you tweeted about Denver and Minnesota, the direction they're going, and, and Minnesota's been a disaster this year. I was watching them uh, last night and, and just, you know, scratching my head about where the direction of that team is. The Kings have kind of fallen off. The Lakers have been a mess. Uh, the whole Pelicans mess. I mean, there are so many interesting stories. By the way, Dallas has now lost six straight. They look like a fun team. And uh, the Lakers have lost, uh, excuse me, the Knicks have lost seven in a row. It seems that Dolan is pretty content on uh, losing on purpose. He said, he actually said it, hey, you don't want to be stuck in the middle. So uh, we're happy and we're making money. He said, we're making the same money with 13 wins. So uh, this NBA season has been very, very interesting. We'll do it again next week when we will be uh, even closer to the finish line. Keith, thanks so much, man. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Talk to you next week. Yeah, man. Keith Smith at Keith Smith NBA. Give him a follow on Twitter.